I'm here with Paula Campbell Roberts from KKR. This is, was a fascinating study to me in part because of the fact that it even exists. So KKR obviously has been around for 40 years. Tell us about why you guys decided to study demographics in the way you did. Sure, thanks for having me on, Jason. The reason KKR continues to be around and continues to be successful is that it reinvents itself as the environment changes. So last year at a partners meeting, the partners were discussing what are the trends, secular themes that might impact investment theses, and demographics emerged as a major one. So Ken Melman, coming out of that meeting, sought me out and, just, and asked me to collaborate with him, and the outcome was this report. And so how do you go about putting together a study like this? How do you decide what to look at? Sure. So this is something that makes me passionate. I love finding topics that are widely misunderstood and doing in-depth research to figure out uh, you know, what might be important. Here, the way you go about it is really thinking about what's going to drive economic change. And so you break that down into component pieces and do research accordingly. And so what jumped out at you? Yeah, and obviously, at the end of this, you have some investment ideas or, or directions to give the give the partners about where to invest, but what jumped out at you along the way in terms of those trends? What really emerged was how important it is to change the way we invest going forward. Mm. So there are three major uh, themes that are, are occurring at the same time. So on the one hand, you have the aging of the population where the over 65 population is growing much faster than the core working age population. And that's just one component. Secondly, you have technology, right? And so while technology can help us improve productivity, it's also disrupting work. And so, you know, there are estimates that 10 to 50 percent of the jobs that exist today may be automated. What will that mean? And then finally, immigration, right? So we have relied on immigration in the United States to propel economic growth. Well, now the attitudes towards immigration are changing dr drastically. So all three of those happening at the same time really change the investing landscape and change the way we need to approach investing going forward. And it does feel like as we talk about what the inputs are to GDP yes. and GDP growth, these aren't always things that we think about. You we think about wages, we think about productivity, but not in, in exactly the way you're thinking. So specifically with aging, that leads to slower growth. Why is that? So the way you think about GDP and on, on a very basic economic level, what feeds GDP growth is an increase in the working age population and an improvement in productivity. And the way I think about it very simplistically is you need more people working and making more widgets yeah. per hour, right? And so what we're saying now is that the growth in the working age part of it, the number of people working is actually slowing over time. Ah, interesting. And so... We can't have a, a discussion about demographics without talking about millennials. Of I'm course. not a millennial, but... Nor am I. Uh, <laughs> but how do they figure into this? Because I feel like that's part of every discussion about the changing workforce and, and economic growth. I'm glad you asked that question. The millennial population is what sets up the United States better than some other countries, like Japan, for example. So because we have a millennial population that's very diverse, so Hispanics represent a significant portion proportion of that population, we actually have higher uh, above average fertility growth. So the slowdown we expect in the labor force won't be as acute in the U.S. versus some other countries. So we still expect growth in that population just at a slower rate. And you mentioned immigration, obviously a hot political issue, but as an economic issue, how does that play out? The, it's a complex issue, as you mentioned. Uh, as, I, as I described, the U.S. has benefited from immigration, Japan less so. The, what makes it complex is there's a difference between high-skilled immigration versus low-skilled immigration, both of which actually benefit the United States. But the complexity is that uh, while lower-skilled immigration may benefit s sectors such as construction, it also places downward pressure on wages in areas w that are also um, have high supply of other low-skilled workers. So I have to ask you, you mentioned your co-author, Ken Melman, yes. former uh, chairman of the Republican National Committee, chaired uh, George W. Bush's re-election campaign. I also happen to know he's a fitness nut. Yes. So yes. healthy living plays into this in a very meaningful way, and not just in the United States, but globally. Talk about that. 
And there, ma there are many aspects of that. I'm glad you asked that question. So healthy living comprises or is driven by, one, the older population, who, of course, is focused more on health care, but also more broadly, millennials, Gen X, are focused on personal health and wellness. And that's from going to the gym. That's athletics. There are many. There, that's food. And as you think about the growing middle class that we're seeing in China and in Mexico, for example, those are areas that we're seeing and we expect to see continued growth. So China, you mentioned, you cannot have an economic, especially a macro global economic conversation without talking about China. How do these trends, especially as it relates to demographic trends, play out in China, maybe versus other parts of the world? We also talk when we, we think about China about this growing millennial population, uh, which will benefit China. The difference between China and the U.S. is that China um, has a very large population, but it's aging more rapidly. The benefit that China has, though, is that it's investing in productivity significantly. And this large millennial population, while they may spend less per, on, an, on a per capita basis versus in the U.S., in size, they represent a, a, a powerful force. And their early adoption of technology represents a very significant significant opportunity. So investing behind that makes a lot of sense. And so staying in Asia for a minute, Japan feels like the classic cautionary tale when it comes to demographics. You know, Abenomics, Abenomics 2.0 is essentially demographically driven. Yes. What are the lessons from Japan? The lessons from the, uh, Japan are maybe you want to op you you could benefit from opening your borders more and leveraging some of that some of that immigration flow, but also it becomes even more important to invest in productivity if you don't have the benefit of inflows. And so, from an investment perspective, of course, we're investing in Japan and we do see opportunity there. But opportunities that cater to this aging population are a, a lot of where we're focused. All right. So tie it all up for us. After studying this. What's your recommendation? What, what was the recommendation you gave to the partners who commissioned you to do this in terms of changing or altering the direction of their investment themes? As we sit in investment committee, I think what we've realized, not just coming out of this report, but from broader conversations, is you cannot continue to invest the way you did in the past, right? And so, yes, you need to understand uh, basics of valuations and multiples, but you also need to understand larger macro themes and how technology and immigration and demographics may alter those themes. So making sure you have those macro conversations in addition to the micro ones is paramount, both for retail investors, institutional investors, and the like. 